Hi, and welcome to the mini lecture on vitamin D and preventing osteoporosis and rickets. In the previous video lecture, we talked about how parathyroid hormone works to increase ionized serum calcium levels. Here we'll talk about the role of parathyroid hormone on activating vitamin D, most importantly to increase dietary calcium absorption. 100 to 200 years ago, rickets was endemic in the inner cities of northern Europe and the United States. Note the effect of rickets on the bone formation of children. In the 1920s, it was discovered that both sunlight or UV irradiation, as shown here, and cod liver oil could both prevent and cure rickets. Imagine what the scientific community must have been thinking. We now know that rickets is caused by a severe deficiency of vitamin D, and that vitamin D can both be made in our skin by UV irradiation, and we can get it as a vitamin in some foods. Note that vitamin D must be further activated in order for it to be fully functional. First, it gets hydroxylated at the 25th position in the liver. And second, in the kidney, it gets hydroxylated at the 1 position, making the fully activated 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Cholesterol is made in the skin from 7-dehydrocholesterol. UV irradiation, the UVB form of the irradiation, breaks this bond. And then the molecule isomerizes to form vitamin D, also called cholecalciferol, in the liver. Oops. This cholecalciferol is first hydroxylated on the 25th position in the liver, and then on this one position in the kidney. Each of these hydroxylation steps occurs by cytochrome P450s, two different cytochrome P450s, and so that we end up with the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. It's also called calcitriol because there are a total of three hydroxyl groups giving the triol. How is parathyroid hormone involved? Parathyroid hormone specifically activates CYP27B1 to increase the renal hydroxylation at position 1. As we'll see in a moment, calcitriol acts as a steroid hormone. And like all other hormones and steroid hormones, it must get inactivated. How do you think that happens? Well, at least one way that it happens is by hydroxylation on the 24 position. That renders the, the hormone inactive. Activated vitamin D, or calcitriol, binds to the vitamin D receptor, a nuclear hormone receptor, which heterodimerizes and binds to DNA binding elements of many genes to activate RNA polymerization to make messenger RNA. We now know that the vitamin D receptor binds greater than 2,000 positions in the human genome, and that over 200 different genes are significantly altered in their expression in response to activated vitamin D and that essentially all of our cells express the vitamin D receptor. So what does this suggest? Well, to me, it suggests that vitamin D is having lots of pleiotropic effects throughout the body. We'll specifically be talking about how vitamin activated vitamin D uh, increases calcium absorption in the intestine, but it must have many more effects, many of which are not fully understood. So activated vitamin D increases the transcription of several genes required to increase the absorption of calcium from our diets. So here's a practice question to help you integrate all the information so far. Vitamin D deficiency is a frequent cause of secondary hyperparathyroidism. So just a mechanism. Here's the overview of calcium homeostasis that we saw in the previous lecture. So if vitamin D is deficient, so this is not working, then we'll have a decrease in calcium absorption from the diet through the intestine that will cause a decrease in serum calcium, which will trigger then the parathyroid glands to increase parathyroid hormone secretion, causing secondary hyperparathyroidism. Recall from the previous lecture that our skeleton serves as a homeostatic calcium reserve. This means when serum calcium levels drop, 
one of the main mechanisms to bring them back up to normal is to begin breaking down bone. And this bone demineralization is what causes osteoporosis. In the graph, we see bone mass as a function of age uh, if for both men in yellow and women in red. Note that we attain our peak bone mass somewhere in the early 20s, 30s, and that after about the age of 40, bone mass begins to deteriorate. In women, the onset of menopause with a uh, big decrease in estrogen greatly accelerates bone demineralization. Here are the current recommendations for building peak bone mass and preventing osteoporosis. First, we must consume adequate amounts of calcium and vitamin D. Second, weight-bearing and muscle-strengthening exercises stimulate um, bone production, helping but make bones stronger. Tobacco and excess alcohol are bad for bones. And then if a patient has osteoporosis, um, health care providers should work on making sure they have decreased risks for fall. It's commonly said that uh, if you live north of the line between Atlanta, Georgia, and L.A., California, that you probably can't make enough vitamin D by sun exposure alone in the wintertime. Well, I wanted to explore if that were true, and these are the data that I found. So on the left-hand side is a curve showing the amount of time that you need a certain amount of sun exposure depending on the UV index. Note that in red is sunburn or erythema that, of course, we want to avoid that UV damage. In the white zone is where we want to be to make enough, uh, to make enough vitamin D. And uh, in the different curves are shown how much of the skin must be exposed. So note that if we're at, in a UV index around 2, then we need significant amounts of sun exposure over large amounts of our skin. So we need you know, at least about 30 minutes uh, to 2 hours of sun exposure down at a low UV index. Then on the right-hand side is the daily UV index in Salt Lake City for 2015. Note that in the winter months, our UV index hovers around 2, which means that we are most likely not going to get enough sun exposure in these months to make sufficient amounts of vitamin D by uh, that method alone. So how much calcium and vitamin D do we need to help us maintain peak bone mass? Well, I recommend that you look at the posted PDF for complete information. A basic summary is that for those of us older than four years old, we need somewhere between 1,000 and 1,300 milligrams of calcium per day. For vitamin D, the recommended daily allowance is six to 800 international units for anyone older than one years old. So a practice question. How much of each of the following do you think you'd need to completely meet the RDA for calcium and vitamin D? And here's the answer. So if you're getting all your calcium from non-fat milk, you'd have to drink just over three cups to get a full 1,000 milligrams. There's only about 100 international units of vitamin D added to milk, so you'd have to drink eight cups to get your full 800 international units. Yogurt is a great source of calcium if it's plain low-fat yogurt. Note that Greek yogurt, while it has more protein, actually has significantly less calcium than regular yogurt does. And also note that most dairy products other than milk have no vitamin D added. Ice cream does have calcium in it, but not a whole lot. You'd actually have to have 12 servings or 6 cups of vanilla ice cream to get all of your calcium, and again, typically does not have any vitamin D added. Salmon has almost no calcium unless you eat the bones, uh, but it does have um, vitamin D, and you'd still have to, you'd have to eat um, close to a pound of salmon to get all the vitamin D that you need. Uh, cod liver, cod liver oil actually has lots of vitamin D, and uh, so so um, fatty fish oils can be a great source of vitamin D. Kale has some calcium, but not a whole lot. You'd have to have 10 cups of raw kale to get all of your calcium. Practice question. 
Based on everything you've learned about vitamin D so far, do you think it's important to consume calcium and vitamin D together in the same meal? No, it's not. So hopefully you're remembering that vitamin D first has to be activated in the liver, then in the kidney, and then it works by binding a nuclear hormone receptor and changing gene transcription. This all takes quite a bit of time uh, to change levels eventually of proteins that can, say, increase calcium absorption in the diet. Before we summarize, please take a moment to reflect on your own personal dietary nutrition analysis. Do you get enough calcium and vitamin D to develop and maintain peak bone health? Do you do enough weight-bearing and muscle-strengthening activities? And in summary, activated vitamin D clearly increases intestinal calcium absorption and has effects on bone and kidney and may have many other effects throughout the body that are not yet well understood. Peak bone density occurs somewhere around the age of 30. And osteoporosis prevention begins by providing sufficient calcium, vitamin D, weight, and weight-bearing exercises to reach peak bone density. And finally, vitamin D deficiency causes bone softening, called rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults.